Hello and welcome to another Homeboys Extra. We're sitting in the centre of Glasgow. I'm delighted to say that we're with the one and only Mr David Farrell. How are you, David? I'm good. Good, good stuff, yep. good stuff. Now, I should probably alert the listeners to the fact that um, if it wasn't for the signing policy of a in Glasgow club, we might not have been sitting here right now. Aye, well, that's true. Um, there was interest when I was uh, 16. Uh, after a cup final, I played against, ironically, Celtic. Uh, mm-hmm. um, where the Rangers scout, who had been aware of me for some time, um, showed a wee bit of interest uh, but he knew of my background and obviously at the time uh, Rangers signing policy as well uh, he recommended me to Oxford United and then the rest is history I suppose <laughs> You talk about Oxford United and people might not be aware of the fact that when you were there you played under Matt Lawrenson That's right What was that like? Uh, interesting <laughs> um, It was only for a short time I was coming towards the end of my two year apprenticeship there but, but I'd been given good signs from the other manager who'd been in place uh, that I was going to get a new contract. Yeah. But when Matt Lawrenson came in, um, he basically disregarded the whole youth system um, and let all the young players go. Um, but I mean, he came in and, and he had been at a club like Liverpool, um, and he tried to he tried to put some of the views across that that would do things a Liverpool way, mm. um, you know, training the way that Liverpool did and doing all the things that the top players do and, and really coaching and teaching very, very little um, and unfortunately for him the, the club actually ended up playing the Oxford United way, yeah. which meant ultimately relegation, so um, it's fair to say it was eventful I mean, have you found that in your career? You've obviously played under some guys who are top players and stuff, do you think it's harder for them to coach because they, perhaps they to, to, be honest, to be honest, it is one of those things that people say and there's no question that um, a lot of the top coaches weren't top players, but in my experience, the ones that I played under, um, or played with even, who went on to become coaches, generally had a decent idea about the game. Um, that, that, that's a personal experience of mine, but I know where that comes from, because if you look at a lot of the top players, uh, sorry, a lot of the top um, coaches, yeah. they haven't been top players. Yeah. I mean, when you were starting your career, how much did you actually think about the game as opposed to just thinking about your own career and how you were going to impress on I think I was quite unusual in that. I was I had a real love for the game. I was I was mm. immersed in it, you know. Um, I used to think about how I was going to play and what I was going to do and guys that I used to look up to and excuse me, players that I would like to play like. Um, I don't think a lot of the players were like that at the time. Um, I think it's more prevalent now where people start to think a wee bit more about the game when they see so much of it on the TV yeah. and the technical side and the statistical side of the game and stuff but it was just something that I always did and I suppose coming from a, a, kind of a relatively working class background in East End of Glasgow football was probably dominating your whole life before you even started playing at a, a decent level pretty much um, I used to go and watch Celtic every week with my dad um, we went everywhere we went all over the country to watch them and I played for boys club in the morning, sorry, the school in the morning, a boys club in the afternoon, and then a boys club on the Sunday. Yeah. So you were playing, you know, three matches in a weekend, pretty much most weekends from the ages of about eight or nine until I was 14, 15. We'll come back to that um, later on in the interview, but obviously you ended up at Easter Road, and that was under the time of Alec Miller. Now, Hibs fans I've spoken to kind of divided opinion on Alec Miller. Some people thought great and I know you've said in the boot games ahead of his time and stuff, other people thought the state of football was rubbish and all this kind of thing he was at Easter Road for 10 years which was quite a, a long time for a man nowadays what were your impressions there? Um, <coughs> I got on really well with Alan um, he was a, a brilliant coach a very very good coach and as, and as you say he was ahead of his time and implementing some of the things that yeah. we did at the Easter Road at the time that the clubs are just starting to kind of catch on you now um, where, the, where there was a difficulty with Alex was that he had this demeanour of being quite a dour yeah. person and I think that sort of a transferred himself onto the terraces and people used to look at that and think well, he's not the guy we want to take our club forward Aye. but if you actually look in, 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 in their results and the, in the time that the club was having um, they were very successful yeah. you know, two cup finals, one won, one lost cup semi-finals, top three in the league uh, European football a couple of times and you, I mean, you just can't argue with his record and those that say he wasn't good for the club at the time, um, I don't really know where they get that from. I mean, there's a lot of good players that used to go at the time. Who, would played with? Who, were the, who were some of the best ones that you played with? 
Well, again, going back to that, we were talking about there um, of Miller having a that the fans had a perception of the football not being very good. Yeah. But we had players like Pat McGinley, you know, Alex signed Kevin McAllister, yeah. Michael O'Neill, Darren Jackson, Keith Wright. Guys like that don't play in a team that doesn't play attacking football. Right. So I, th- I think that perception of the way the team played at that time wasn't always necessarily true. And um, one of the things that you touched on in your book regarding Hibs, and I'm really interested in, was obviously you played at a time when they weren't really successful against Hearts for whatever reason. And one of the things that you outlined was you just didn't feel as though you Hibs team was angry yeah. enough to win it. I mean, yeah. that's something I'm really interested in because I think. There's a, there's a definite parallel to draw between Celtic in, in the 90s against Rangers and the same way mm-hmm. Hibs against Hearts. I mean, why do you think that is? Um, I think a lot of it was down to the fact that we were a good football team. You know, that, that team that I just kind of outlined there had a lot of really nice footballers. Um, but the, to me, the emphasis was always on that our football would win the day. You know, even though it was a derby, I felt as though we really had to try and go to war in the derbies because that's what Hearts did. There's yeah. no question that's what that Hearts team did for a long period of time. Um, and I just felt that there was something just that wee bit missing and, and I wished sometimes we were just sent out with a, with a battle armour on, you know, and just saying, let's get right in about this team here. And although that's expected in a derby, I never really felt as though it was the emphasis yeah. which, I, which we needed, you know. Yeah, I was going to say that, you talked about being sent out. I mean, do you think there are some players who still actually need that? You actually need to be told Definitely. this is what you need to do. Definitely. There's players who find it difficult to fire themselves up. You know, it will maybe take something that happens in a game mm. or an incident or a dressing room beforehand to get really worked up yeah. before they're, they're at it, you know. And and that was just something that I felt was just that wee bit lacking when we, when we played against us. And I think it's proven out in the statistics. You know, 22 games in a row we didn't yeah. win. That, there's a reason behind that. Yeah, yeah. It can't it just be luck, you know what I mean? And I suppose one of the, the, the games that I looked at, which was probably the, and you talked about it yourself, probably the worst one was the cup game at Easter Road. Where Fozzie and, scored. Aye. We battered them. Exactly. You know, we battered them. That, that was one of the occasions where you would say that what I'm talking about, we probably did for the majority of the game, mm-hmm. but there was just something that didn't allow us to turn that into a victory. And... Hearts again soaked up the pressure, did what they did, and nicked a goal late on. And I mean, that day when when they scored that day, that was the worst. Right. You know, that was a horrendous feeling because we actually felt that was going to be the day. During the game, I certainly felt as though this is the day. You know, we're going to do the day. We have to. And again, it, it just it battered you again. You know. That's what I'm just going to ask you. I mean, at what point does a run like that become psychological? Of course, it does. I mean, do you actually get the feeling say, are we ever going to beat these again here? You, of course you do. I mean, it's one of those sort of myths that people talk about in football where you, you know, you're approached the next game, it's all gone, it's all in the past and all that. Yeah, but yeah. there's no doubt it, it works away in your mind, you know, that I think I talk about this, the psychological side of football yeah. a lot in my book and people tend to shy away from it. Yeah. Know, there's no doubt things like that have a mental effect on your approach. You know, there's a safety about the way you're going to start or play the game. You know, you're not going to necessarily take that chance or going whipping across the way you should naturally because you're still that wee bit yeah. on edge because your mind's telling you you've not beat them for 20 games you've See, not beat them it's something I've, I've thought about a lot because it, you know you don't get to anywhere near the level you played it unless you can play football so therefore you need an edge and different things and one of them has to be in the belief and the confidence that I'm sure there were games where you in training and just playing yourself you could do things and then in a game sometimes you just can't mm. translate it because of the pressure and definitely and there's like all that. different factors that do affect it and I mean a lot of the time as well you're, you're maybe in a position where rarely when you're playing once a season starts but you're playing at 100% you, know, you might only have a niggle that's yeah. been acting away at you for 3 or 4 weeks and people don't necessarily know that you know, you've, been, yeah. you've been running about injured for the last 6 weeks Eventually you break down and people think, well, there he goes again. Yeah. They don't realise you've been carrying it for six weeks, you know, yeah. and that's maybe it takes a wee bit of edge off of things as well at times. There's just loads of different factors that can affect it, and I think that's something that I've kind of put into the book. Mm. All those different things that people don't actually see or hear or read about normally, all those wee taboos that people think, they're nothing to do with it, you know. Well, that's the thing, I mean, regarding the book itself, I mean, I've read a lot of football 
player autobiography, some of them have been utter not rubbish, you know what I mean? Um, particular instance, Stephen Gerrard wrote one out ten years ago, then wrote another one out two months ago, and I thought, well, can I have my money back for the first one? Because that was a lot of crap. Your one goes into you know, the minutiae of what it's like to be that kind of player. And it's see, I mean, I've, I've often spoke to players who have said, fans don't have any idea what goes on behind the yeah. scenes. And that's what really came out of your Now they have for a first one. Yeah, exactly, because... And, and, and it's no all gl- glitz and glamour no. and big money and all that, and that's the thing I was interested in. Um, but, I mean, for one of the things I thought was really, really brave of you to do was talk about when you had to sign on. And, I mean, that's something that nobody, I think, really realises is a yeah. football players what have to do. Yeah. I mean, what was that like for you? It was it's horrendous. You know, four or five years previous to that, I'm playing in the Premier League against yeah. Celtic Rangers. You know, you're on sports scene, you're on Scott Sport. You're, you're revered yeah. and then all of a sudden it's all taken away from you and you need to go through the, the embarrassment of signing on now that's not to say that it is an embarrassing thing mm-hmm. but for me having been someone who people may be seen on the TV now and again yeah. to walking into the job centre where junkies nomads all sorts of people from all walks of life looking at me and possibly pointing at me and going that's that guy that used to play football. Right. That doesn't feel nice. And no. I, I'm not trying to be down on the people who do have to, you know, sign on and find themselves in that position. Yeah. But it isn't nice. It's no. not nice. You know, you're going and I, I used to buy a newspaper so that I could keep my head down and put the head the, the, the newspaper above so that nobody could see me. I'd go in with my card, give the guy it, walk away, go and take my seat, put the newspaper up. Well, see, this is the thing. I mean, I've signed on many things myself and. How you actually describe the situation, and I would urge anybody to read this bit of the book, it's perfect. The whole farce, the whole... It's degrading. Ah, it's, the whole it's, place it's is designed. degrading. It's designed for no other reason than to get yeah. you back out the door again. Yeah. Nothing else. Even to the point about your job search and writing yeah. the room and all this kind of nonsense. And it's just... Yeah, I mean, I think that is, and I think... I mean... It's a big pretense. Yeah. You know, everybody yeah. in there, they all pretend that they're all caring for you and they all want to find you a job. They don't. They want to get you off the list. Uh, uh, whether it's you walking out, whether it's you've had enough, whether they've had enough, they'll find something to do it. Mm-hmm. But that's the whole point of job centres. Yeah. Not to try and find you work, it's to get you off the list. I suppose, to segue into that, another place you walked in you might have not felt quite welcome is when you walked into Airdrie and a ja- dressing room fully jambos. That's right. What was, it was that was quite interesting because it, 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 it sounded like you genuinely, there was a wee bit. Can I, oh, Absolutely, yes, there was trepidation because um, the, the, the type of player that I was, I had built my career around being that kind of hard guy. Yeah. You know, the guy who kicked everybody and, and was the nasty type of person in a team. So I think it would have been slightly easier if I had been a nice ball player and they knew what they were getting when they came. Yeah. And But they probably were having me walked in the door expecting to see some aggressive maniac wondering what was going to happen to their group, their dressing room, their team spirit. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I had to quickly dispel that and say, look, that's no me. You can trust me on the pitch and I'll do what you like and I'll run through brick walls for you. But the person's totally different for that. And one of the things you did in the book regarding that was you probably uh, confirmed a lot of theories about Alec MacDonald <laughs> and the kind of person he is in his style management. But ultimately, it was pretty successful. He was brilliant. Alan McDonald was brilliant. He was an absolutely brilliant man and a brilliant manager. And that, that's what made him the guy that he was. You know, we were from two entirely different backgrounds. Um, but it was never any kind of issue. The Celtic Rangers thing, the product of the Catholic thing, never any kind of issue. Um, there was jokes made about it in the dressing room, all those wee tiny little yeah, things. Yeah. But it was man against man. You know, if you couldn't take that, then you couldn't stand Alan, Alan McDonald's dressing room. Yeah. That was yeah. part of what he was all about. You know, you had to be able to deal with those little things. Um, but it was never an issue. It was brilliant. He was a great man manager. That was a huge thing about Alan McDonald. I suppose, I mean, the, the kind of Yuji thing went through circle on you a wee bit as the problems of the park started. And you sort of started to get a wee bit of blame for things that was going on, particularly for Gary McKay, is that right? Well, it was... It, at the time, it wasn't so much that I started to recognise it just after that the, the, the stuff really came to your head. Um, 
obviously with Steve Archibald coming in and looking to take over at that time, yeah. I had played with Stevie at Hibs, I'd done one or two things for him over the years, like coaching courses and stuff, and people seemed to think that I had a hotline to Steve to what was going on, when I never, yeah. you know, there was the odd occasion he would phone me, but he was phoning me for entirely different reasons to him taking over the club. I didn't realise this until afterwards. He was kind of sounding me out a wee bit, and you know, yeah, what's going on here and who's this? Because it was as far as I was concerned, he was coming in as an agent mm-hmm. to try and see some of the young boys bring into the team at the time, and then see what happens after that. And then all of a sudden, it's kind of come to a head when it's it's now uh, got to the point where he is taking over, and we're all sitting waiting to find out what's happening, me included. And the manager bursts in the door. Gary bursts in the door and says, "Better go and speak to your man." Not in as nice terms as that, I have yeah, to yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. But you better go and speak to your man and find out what's happening. And I'm like, what do you mean? And then, well, he's, he's taking over, he's taking training tomorrow. So, so I had to go and make the phone call, find out who he wants to keep, who he didn't want to keep for training the next day, yeah. basically. And then came back into the dressing room and said, look, we're all training. Stevie will speak to everybody tomorrow. Because I wasn't going back in to tell guys like Kenny Black and Sandy Stewart or that they were about to be released because he was right. basically letting go all of the senior players. I thought I was going to be one as well. Right. You know, he just told me the senior players are all gone. But because I was injured, he stood by me and gave me the time to get fit again, which is what clubs tend to do. You know, if you've got a player that's injured, he's either out of contract or something's happening, you tend to stick by that person and then once he's fit again, you make a decision. Yeah. But once I was fit again, I was straight out the door. <laughs> which kind of shows you that there was no dodgy deal and anything like that going on behind the scenes. Yeah. So, but there's no doubt that one or two of them felt at the time that I knew more of them what was going on. I mean, you talked about Steve Archibald here, and it's something I wanted to speak to you about. I think Steve Archibald, especially for maybe a, a generation beneath us, they will not actually understand how good a football player no. he was. The clubs he played for, Aberdeen, Spurs, Barcelona, and then obviously he goes to Hibs. How good a player was he and what kind of influence was he like at Easter Road? He was absolutely magnificent. Without question, the best player I ever played with. Um, I, well, yeah, I used to watch him, obviously, and I used to go to Celtic games and that, yeah. that time were fantastic. And I never really seen what Steve Archibald did or was until I played with him. Yeah. He was a phenomenal footballer. Great touch, great technique. Awareness, ability to bring people into the game, led the line himself. The biggest thing about him, though, he had incredible self belief. Yeah. He was a really selfish in a good way, selfish in a good way for him. Incredible yeah. self belief, really I can, I can see that. I mean, driven person. When I was looking him up yesterday, one of the stories that came out was that when he was effectively signed when Maradona left Barcelona, him and, and, and Bern Schuster. And they offered Bern Schuster the number 10, and he said, Oh, no, no danger. Archibald's guy, I'll take it. it. Yeah. That, that would be typical of him. That would be typical. And would he have been a leader for younger players as well at that time? He was great. He was great. Um, he, was, he, was, uh, he was quite al- al- alone, Steve. He wasn't the one who was a, a huge mixer among the group. Yeah. But when you did get him out and about, he was great company, you know, he was a, a, a brilliant guy. Um, but he did everything correctly. Everything was spot on, you know. His towel had to be perfect, his kit had to be perfect. <laughs> Everything was bang on, you know. He used to warm up himself because he had this warm up that he got when he was in Tottenham. Right. Uh, he was a guy, I can't remember the guy's name, but the guy was an England um, medical person at the time. He gave Stevie this warm up, Stevie done it through his whole career. Now, in football, someone who does that would tend to be a bit of an outcast because everybody else is thinking, what's he up to? See, when Stevie done it, everybody was thinking, can we do that? Yeah. I mean, everybody wants to know what he was doing. Normally it would be shunned. Uh-huh. Whereas, when Stevie Archibald done it, it was like, well, what are you doing? You know, trying to get in and see what it was he was all about, you know? I want to take you back to a, a moment in your career at Hibs. You played in a cup final at Celtic Park against Rangers. Now, as a, a young East End Celtic supporter growing up, I mean, that, that's the stuff that dreams are made, isn't it? I mean, Absolutely. I mean, it, 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 it was the stuff that dreams are made in. That was the pinnacle of my playing career, playing in a cup final at Celtic Park against Rangers. I mean, you, yeah. you, you actually couldn't have written the script. Well, you could have written it, we'd have won. Aye, aye, if I'd have wrote the script aye, myself, aye, we would have won. Um, but no, the occasion was incredible, you know, that was, that, was a, that was a brilliant thing. I mean, that was, you know, 
were obviously a fantastic Rangers team, a pretty decent Hibs team as well. And it was kind of like another one of the games where they'd scored first, then you got the equaliser through the OG. And then we had them rocking for 15, 10 minutes. Aye, we did, aye. we had them absolutely rocking for 10 minutes. The, the, the first half was nothing. There was nothing really happened. Both teams were just kind of sizing each other up. and It was a poor game. Aye. And then Durante scored. Aye. A really good goal. Played a 1-2. Got a wee bit of lucky deflection and then lifted it over Jim. But only about five or six minutes later or so, we scored. I think Keith Wright still claims it to this day. But it was a David McPherson OG. Um, and for the next ten minutes, we were really, really in top of him. Darren was through on the goalie. I think Big Maxi saved it. Um, and at that point, you, you could feel it. You know, when people talk about things like that from the stand, sometimes you can feel it. You, know, you can feel as though the momentum is going your way, and all of a sudden you, you really fancy it. And then, of course, they brought the Cloyston, I know. which which meant the script was ultimately written yeah. after being out for five months and he scored the overhead kick. But it was a, it was a brilliant occasion. Brilliant I mean, to be it's, part inc- of. it's incredible when you talk about this in the book, kind of the fine lines in football between success and failure. You win that game, you've won two cups in three years. You know, that suddenly becomes, in terms of Hibs in the last 40 odd years, a really golden era. But then all of a sudden, within a couple of years away, somebody else, yeah. and everything just kind of goes and yeah. everybody falls. You know, and it is, it's just that fine line. But one of the things I was really interested in the book, because this is a common thing that's been coming up um, in terms of finishing your career and going to Larks and being coaching in that, and you were not as many people, one of the greatest fans of that. No, the, the, I, I maybe don't get that across properly. The, the coaching side of it, I had to get involved in. I was always going to be a coach. Yeah. So the coaches themselves down there, as individual coaches, know the game and they know how to put themselves across. And it's, it's the whole SFA coaching yeah. mafia, so to speak, that goes with it. That's the difficult part because being the person that I am. I was never going to be one that was going to try and kowtow with people and get myself further up the ladder, so to speak, by being in yeah, the group, yeah. if you know yeah. what I mean. Yeah. Um, whereas a lot of people go down there do that and they get themselves up there yeah. and they get themselves up and, and it's maybe a fault in mine. Maybe I need to be a wee bit more. Well, it's funny you say that because I spoke to someone who was a manager of the SPL and done their badges in Ireland and he always felt that I went against them in Scotch It would have. It would have. I mean, I, I think I've highlighted it in the book. There's, there's no question a lot of managers in Scotland get their jobs through the influence of the people within the SFA, within the, the lads, within all that kind of stuff. There's no question it happens. You know, I word in the right ear mm-hmm. in any industry um, certainly helps. I mean, obviously, you still went into coaching and things, um, and you were obviously at Dundee with Alex Ray, and this is something I've noticed on Twitter, where you just seem to get abused for having a good friend who happened to be a, a, a Rangers man, you know what I mean, and trying to justify that and all that. Yeah, most people are fine, just, honestly, in terms of Twitter and, and my profile and stuff like that, most people are great. Uh, you know, if, if Alec and I are having a bit of banter, though, you'll get one or two people who will come in and, and change it to the sectarian side or the religious side or the EBTs or whatever it is and just try and get in there, you know. You just need to deal with that. It's just part and parcel of what it's all about, I think. You made a statement on Twitter about two weeks ago regarding the EBTs, which was pretty unequivocal and yet I've still seen you getting abused for the fact <laughs> that you've only basically strangled an alley. Aye, that was it. That was it. <laughs> it was that somebody had, had pulled me up, apparently, for not, for not calling Alec out on Radio Clyde. And I was like, well, what do you want me to say? Do you want me to hang my best mate out to dry right there and then? I wasn't even asked the question anyway, but then I, I, I came out and I stated exactly what my thoughts were on it. So what more did they want? But it wasn't enough. It's never enough. You want it, like, regarding when you were paid in Scottish football, did you, was it always an agent that done your wages? Nah. You just I've done them all myself, apart myself. from the first move for Hibs to Partick I mean, I, you know, I'm not trying to denigrate your career, but if you get to the level certain players are at and the money's that big... You do need it. Uh, they, they won't really be dealing with the contract side of it. No, they, they won't, but they'll be 100% aware of what is in the contract and what they're getting. So you've done all your you know, contract negotiations yourself? Then? Yeah, apart from when I went from, um, Partick, from Hibs to Partick Thistle. But even, excuse me, even then... 
and I still pretty much done it myself, just kind of battering back and forward with the agent. So How would you do that? Would you just ask other players what they would get in? Or? You, you always, there's always a kind of, you have an idea, but mm. generally you, you go on what you're on at the moment. You know, so you go to see somebody, so I'm on that, give us an extra hundred quid and I'll be quite happy. You know, and that tended to be the way it was back then. It was the same when you were signing a, a new contract for the same club. You know, those negotiations were dead simple because they knew what the situation was. You knew how much you were on. An extra 50 quid and another 500 quid to sign. There you go. Deal's done, you know, and that's kind of the way it was then. <laughs> simpler, simpler. Simpler yeah. stuff. But obviously you ended up with Alex at Dundee. I mean, what was that like with your mate and manager a club like Dundee? It was great. It was a brilliant. I mean, we, just, we just seen it as a, as a massive opportunity. Dundee are a, are, a, are a decent club, you know. In terms of size and stature in Scottish football, they're a decent club. They had obviously been through the ravages of the administration, yeah, which meant yeah. it was a difficult, difficult job. Um, but no, it was brilliant. It was just a great opportunity for us. Yeah, I mean, it's... Suppose, I mean, as it, as it goes on now, I think it is, you touch on the last thing again, and that, it is guy, for guys like yourself, it does seem to be harder and harder to get into the game, to get into coaching positions and stuff like that. And similarly, we punditry, mm-hmm. which is something, and now I actually, and you'll know this because I only happened just today, I actually spoke to uh, somebody at Radio Scotland just today who said that they were really enjoying the punditry that you had done and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And we had this whole discussion about, and I said, well, it should be guys like that that are being pundits because it's no bullshit, it's no pandering as you often talk about. Um, but yet, you seem to be. There's a fear about aye. it. You know, well, that, what is that? Well, I think a lot, to, it always comes down to self preservation, and it's the same in football. You know, if somebody was to take a chance on me, knowing what I'm like, knowing that I've got a wee bit of profile on Twitter, knowing that I'm going to speak my mind, and that's another thing that people talk about, you know, I speak my mind. You don't really. Yeah. You know, that's one of those sayings that people just come out with. They don't really speak their mind. There's always that little bit that holds them back. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I genuinely believe that there is still a fear of that type of person, or of, of me being a wee bit too outspoken or saying too much, but I'm clever enough, intelligent enough to temper those opinions to make sure that it's not going to get people into any trouble. And I think that's what yeah. I think. People think that if I say something that's out of turn, it comes back to them, not necessarily me. Yeah. And that's where the self-preservation part comes in there. I mean, I think, I mean, like, for a, 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 an example, the spell, I think, like, every the last season where uh, Jim Goodwin was sent off think, three times in four games or something and every time he was saying off Stephen Thompson his teammate was only supposed to talk about it. and you know he's never going to hang him out yeah, to dry yeah it's difficult it's a difficult thing especially when it's your teammate yeah because you've got to go back into that dress it's different if you're no longer playing like, I'm no longer playing anymore so I, I don't really care who upset yeah. and that's that's part of the book you know yeah. it's not going to come back and bite me in the backside now right but in terms of the guys who are in the game and them being the pundits, it's really, really difficult because yeah. you can't go back into that dressing room the next morning and they're all waiting for you with their arms out saying, what was that all about? That's what yeah. makes it difficult. So, uh, Come back to that in a bit, but one of the things I wanted to ask you is Celtic Nation. Now, Celtic Nation, Celtic don't get that Nation, wrong sorry, now. Aye. Now, this whole thing baffles me, this whole setup. Because all of a sudden this team appears, here's the name, you're doing there, Wally McStay's doing there, buses have gone down there. How did that come about for you? It was a brilliant idea and a brilliant concept. The, the, the phone, I received a phone call from an agent, an agent with links to Celtic, um, asking me if I was interested in being an assistant manager at Celtic Nation. Now, when I say links to Celtic, I don't mean he was part of the club or anything like that. Yeah. You know, I'm talking about somebody who was Celtic-minded. Right, OK. Um, and when I heard Willie McStay was involved, I thought, aye, fantastic, bring it on. Let's have a go to and see what it's all about. So that's what we did. We got outlined the plans. We were told that money wasn't going to be so much of a problem and we could sign the players that we wanted to try and sign within that sort of a budget, you know. Um, and we did, and, and we... We went for it, and we were actually done really well down there. You know, we only lost something like three or four games out of thirty-five games, which was brilliant going. And 
but when it ended up that it couldn't actually go up at the end, that, that sort of started to put a, a head on things a wee bit, because I think they were expecting the progression to be season on season, you know, but a lot of politics behind the scenes that ended well, up costing a lot I more mean, than the Did you result. think there was resistance? Absolutely. I mean, I've seen a lot of stuff banded about all oh, the Scots mob this and the Scots mob that. Did that come across to you? There's, there's always resistance to money. People at any level, at any, any club, any league, wherever you are, if somebody all of a sudden comes in <coughs> and starts throwing money about, you're looked upon as a target right away. Who do they think they are coming to take over uh, a league? You know, whether that team's been in that league for 10, 15, 20, 100 years, doesn't matter. People all of a sudden see that as, oh, there's the, there's the big time Charlies. And that's what it was more than anything else. It just happened that we were at Scottish, mm. signing some Scottish players in an English league, which then meant that it also became, there's the Scottish big time Charlies. <laughs> but it was, it, was, it was an adventure. There was I mean, definitely I, resistance yet. Because it was like, even at that time when things were going really well, I mean, I heard people at Celtic talking about well, if we bought the aim, and is that the avenue into the English league, you know, this kind of thing, and it was really, people were getting really yeah. kind of excited about it. But it, it, it has to be said that there was never anything said um, on a, an official capacity or anything like that about it being a Celtic feeder club yeah. or a Celtic link. There was those huge rumours, and it was always there in the background, but there was never anything that actually we were told or were made aware of that that was part of the plan. Yeah. Our, our plan was completely separate to that. Yeah, yeah. yeah but it didn't help that we wore Celtic shirts and, and yeah. got the Celtic fans doing put Willie and I in. There was, <laughs> I, well, there was, I mean, certainly in, in my experience, there was people abroad and things were saying to me, is that, have we got an English team? Is that, and I was like, no, 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 not quite. Yeah. We're on the website, buy the strip and all that yeah. kind of thing. But to say we went to Celtic, I mean, obviously you've been a Celtic supporter all your life, you've seen ticket holder. We didn't even gear away two tickets at the weekend there for yeah, yeah. the evening, which um, I heard mentioned on, even on the radio. Um, what do you think about the club now? Uh, team, well, let's talk about the team first. What do you think yeah. about the team? The team domestically are okay. The, the downsizing of the club, which has been going on for probably three or four years now, yeah. It, it has to have an effect. There's no question it's having an effect. Um, the, the standard of player that's there isn't quite as good as what it's been over the last, not even going back to the Sutton and the Larsons and the Hudson era, even for the last four or five years, it's yeah. slightly less than that. Yeah. But they'll still do enough to win the league domestically quite comfortably. Yeah. Um, whether there's been progression, that's the difficult part for me because when I see the two European campaigns, I don't, I don't really see it. You know, I don't see any progression at all on that side. Um, and even at times in the league, it, it seems to be a good game, a not so good game. That there's yeah. no any real level of consistency yet. But that also comes from not having top players. Yeah, it's it's one of the things where fans see it all the time where. They'll, they'll look at a team or they'll look at players and say, but they've done this in this game, why can't they do that every week? And it's a simple reason is they're just not good enough. Yeah, that simple. is the bottom line. One of the things I wanted to ask you about the team was, as an opposition player, if you were facing guys that say, say that they're saying, for the likes of Dunyan, do you feel them as much as you would? I, I think as long as those players are the best players in their team, I think you would still fear them because traditionally, when players come from Hibs, Dundee United, Aberdeen, Hearts, whoever it is, to Celtic, they'll generally have been the best player, and then that player tends to kick on. And the Celtic team, if he, excuse me, if he doesn't, he drifts away, yeah. and he'll be replaced by someone else. So there isn't really a, a thought of it not being a fear because they've signed him from elsewhere, because um, they're only going to go into one part of the Celtic team, which is still quite formidable regardless. One of the players, say, single out one player, Gary Mackay Stephen. Now, Jackie McNamara said it took a year for him to get the aggression that he needed on the pitch at Dundee United. And when Mackay Stephen asked him for his advice, he said, go there with the fire in your belly. And I think that's something 
players like you had an abundance. Yeah. It was something we didn't even you can't, talk about. You can't now. put it into pe- you can't put it into people. I learned that very quickly at Dundee when I was a coach, my first real coaching job. Um, you, you can't put that fire into people. Some people are technically gifted and very good players and, and quite laid back and you can't tell that guy to get fire in his belly because if he's no got it naturally, he'll never have it. But that doesn't mean to say that you can't be a top player without it. Yeah. But if you want to play for a club like Celtic and you want to be the type of player that Gary McKay Steven is, he will need to find something that gives him that wee bit extra yeah. because he had a good initial impact. Yeah. And since yeah. then, he's kind of drifted back in. I always call it revert to time. As a footballer, you, you kind of create something that's no there. Right. So you have a, it's like, it's like managers as well. Managers come in for six games and have an impact, but then all of a sudden, those those same players, there's been a, 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 a wee bit of a buzz and something happens for six games or so, and then it reverts back to the form that it was. Yeah. It, 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 it just happens. It's natural. And Ronnie Dial, I'm touched on the, the disappointing European campaigns. What I to ask you is, we all know every week what set up, what system he's going to play. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's only a good thing if you're steamrolling everybody and they have a fear of it. Yeah. I'm not so sure that telling everybody every week where you want to, how you're going to play, um, unless it's against the majority of teams in Scotland that are not going to be able to handle it anyway. But there, there has to be, in my opinion, there has to be something at times where you say, right, OK, this isn't working, we have to do this. It, it surprised me when, when it came out two weeks ago that they said we're not going to change, this is the way we're going to play and that's it. Yeah. I was surprised that any top-level coach would be so closed to actually say, well, maybe that's not working in certain games or at certain times we might have to look at doing this or this. Yeah, because... But it seemed to be dismissed completely. Yeah, yeah. And, and obviously you've done coaching and things, it's just the manager and other... Isn't it better to, 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 to kind of apply systems to the players you have rather than the other way about with you? Right, well, the, the, it's a balance. It's a balance because, I mean, when I went to, to Partick Thistle and then John McVeigh came in, John had been at Airdrie and John yeah. tried to make us play the way that Airdrie did. But we didn't have the players to do that. Yeah. So if, if you don't have the players to play a certain system, then it's folly as a manager or a coach to continue to try and ram it down their throat. Now, I'm not saying that Celtic can't play the system they're playing because 4 2 3 1 is successful domestically. But I'm also certain that with the players that Celtic have, 4 4 2 would be, would be successful domestically yeah. with those players. Yeah. You know, it's because they've got better players than everybody else. It's not actually because of the system. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's obvious, and I think it's increasingly becoming apparent that we're, we're too good for Scottish football, but we're not good enough for European football. I mean, how hard is it for players to step up to a level? It's, it's, it, it's, it depends on the level of the player. Yeah. And that's the problem. That is the issue, you know. The downsizing is having a huge effect. Yeah. But having said that, I think that given the players that we do have, they should have performed better in Europe this season than they did. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I mean, it's, um, it's a couple of things. That, I mean, they've conceded two goals in every European game, and they're going to end up getting not too quite shortly. And um, particularly the Molder game away, I was talking to an expert, I was trying to talk about tactics, and they said, look, if you can't pass the ball to A to B, it doesn't matter what tactics you play. Well, and it does. Well, it tell does. Me then. Because, well, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, the first goal in Molder mm-hmm. was Celtic were in possession. Yeah. Boyata gives the ball away. But at that point, both throwbacks are charged forward. Yeah. Now, if you're playing a system away from home where you're back four, you see you don't move, don't cross a halfway line. Mm-hmm. Boyata gives the ball away. He's still got the whole secure back four to beat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it doesn't matter at that point whether or not the ball was given away. The fact that the ball was given away left Celtic vulnerable because the two fullbacks were pushed so far forward. So it does, it does matter. With, you know, your system still matters when you're giving the ball away. They call it offensive marking abroad. When you're actually marking when you're in possession of the ball. Where should you be in case this breaks down? 
Celtic don't seem to have that away from home in Europe. They only seem to have we play, we attack, and then we try and get back if we can. Because if, if 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 Lustig had gone down that one that side when Boyata gave that ball away, and and Nizagiri had tucked in like you would normally expect it to be, he would have been in in a three beside Ambrose with the guy who split them. Yeah. Whereas it ended up one on one. So there's no cover. It's interesting. You mentioned Ambrose there. Now you'll have seen this yourself when you go to games. There's quite a there's a kind of feeling goes around the Celtic support every time he gets the ball at times. Yeah. What would you do with a player like that? Wouldn't play him. Just don't play him. No good enough. Not in my opinion. But I mean he has he has attributes. He's very quick, athletic, yeah. good in the air, but in terms of a defender. Um, I think he causes more problems not only for himself but for the rest of the back four as well because they don't know what he's doing. They don't know where his next mistake's coming from. And you as a midfield player having somebody like that behind you, does that affect your game? It affects everyone's game. Everyone's game. If I, if I had to play him, I would play him at right back. But it's more out of the way. It's not yeah. so much a crucial mistake. If you, if you make a mistake out there, there's other people who can get back in cover. If you make a mistake at centre back, it's oh. And one, other, one last thing on the team as well, as, a, as an expert field player yourself, what do you think's happened to Stephen Johansson this season? I, I need to be honest and say that I didn't see the, 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 the player of the year for him last year either. Yeah. I thought he had a good spell where he was playing well, scoring goals, but I didn't think he was player of the year. Um, I think his attitude this season at times hasn't been great when I've watched him the, the little petty things that I see arguing with referees pulling jerseys silly free kicks all those little things are odd indiscipline is the first sign of a player not on form right you know it, it's no good when you do things like that because it, it detracts for the rest of your game as well and Celtic lost the goal at Celtic Park from uh, in the Malmo game I think it was Berget scored the goal yeah. in injury time yeah. It came from Johansson giving away a corner and then he argued about a free kick, he's still trying to creep up yeah. about and he eventually gets booked. Now all that pantomime affects what's going on in the box. Because people are all going, what's he going to come in the box? What's he doing? Aye. What's going on there? The, 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 his whole round, all round game has been really cool this season. And, it, and the, the only thing, the only way that he can get back to being good again is to sort his discipline out and do the simple things get back to just playing football again don't worry about what's going on around the pitch and trying to fight everybody's battles just play because he's a natural player a natural off the cuff good footballer yeah and Celtic as a whole when you talk about the downsides and um, where do you see the future of Celtic they're at a crossroads yeah because next season obviously Rangers will be you would expect back in the league again and, and that brings a completely different challenge. I think everyone would like to see an improvement in the level of the squad yeah. for that coming. Um, I think my opinion all, all along has been that, that the downsizing has been for that reason, waiting yeah. for the time when Rangers come back and then spending a wee bit more again and trying to keep, make sure that gap that exists at the moment is maintained. Yeah. I'm not so sure they'll do it though. No, it's something, um, certainly in my life, things, certainly. I've never built for positions of strength. I don't, I don't have a problem with the, the policy as such because we've seen what's happened to Rangers. Yeah. You know, the way the club has been run has been fantastic. Off the pitch, absolutely fantastic. There's no complaints about that. Um, the difficulty though is that we would always like to see just that wee bit more let go to bring in that wee bit extra quality and, and that's where the crossroads is this year will they do that will they gamble just a wee bit yeah and I'm not sure yeah suppose that as well it comes to a little as you as, as, as a fan now who pays his money in most of the games you have got to excite your supporters you know what I mean you've got to I think there is a wee bit of we're doing it out of duty at the minute we're going to games and stuff but we want to be, we want to see the big, because you know, as you say, like, forget Larson and Sutton, he would go back to Joe Ledley and Yama and all that kind of thing. It was only a couple of years ago, yeah. and yet the whole team's completely It changed. seems miles away from that, because yeah. uh, I think you're right, I think 
but that's part of being a supporter, isn't it? Yeah. You just go whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. That's what happens. I mean, it, I took my wee boy, started taking him three or four years ago, and one of the first things I said to him was, you know, remember the good times, but there'll be a lot of bad times in the corner. Yeah. You know, losing cup finals at Hamden under Neil Lennon and. and you were walking out of there sometimes feeling as if I can't believe this is happening I know I you know, know and it was trying to say and I'm saying to myself should I be bringing him into this <laughs> you know all this, all this stuff that I went through over the years should I, I really be doing this I to know. him Some, but you do it's just part of what you do isn't it sometimes you just wish you supported Albion Rovers or something but don't worry see, see that's the thing we, see because we support what we perceive to be a bigger club yeah. don't think their supporters don't go through that as well yeah just because they support us club, it's a smaller level. Don't think they don't go through the heartaches of relegation. Yeah. You know, staying up, no staying up, missing out in the playoffs, yeah. last minute defeats. They still feel it as well. No, I mean, I was at Easter Road a couple of weeks ago when I was beat Dun United in the cup. And I took my son along just for a, for a game of football and he was like, look at the house fans, it's like they've won the Champions League. I said, they've not exactly been leading with success recently. But that's what it is. You know, you, know, get, when you get it, you've got to keep a hold of it. Because yeah. you know what's coming. They know at some point it's coming to battle you done again. Right, definitely. I mean, that's, that's it. Eh? Well, we'll wrap this up. A few things before we wrap this up. Uh, tell us about the blog and why you started blogging. Um, the, why I started blogging was probably one of the main reasons why I wrote the book as well. I wanted to dispel quite a lot of myths. Yeah. Um, the old footballers are thick for yeah. a start. That was one. Um, I also felt as though there were quite a lot of people in the game who were writing stuff in columns and things like that, and again, it talked about that pandering and yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. pretending you were giving an opinion, but a lot of it was more about self-promotion than anything yeah. else. Um, and I think it gave people a wee insight into some of the things that goes on in football that they don't really understand or see. Yeah, and of course, as you say, it became a book, a very, very good book, called Taxi for Farrell, which will come onto the title in a minute. Um, how long did it take you to write the book? Six months. Six months. And how did you find the process? It was okay. Um, I, I, I obviously worked in the taxi now, and when I'm sitting at the taxi rank, that was when I was writing the book. I wasn't writing at home or anything like that. Right. When I was finding spare time during the day, I just done the whole thing on my Blackberry. Uh-huh. So I was doing it as you know, a couple of thousand words here and there. Just, I never had any particular plan. Some people were saying to me, do 500 words a day or do 2,000 words a week. And I was just doing it when I could. And whenever it was coming, it was flowing and it was going fine. Um, the original plan was to actually start with the blogs and build my story into it. Yeah. But then once I started writing, we knew that it was just going to become my story with bits of the blog being able to be fed in and different observations throughout it. Um, the difficult part was when my dad died halfway yeah. through it, yeah. um, and that that became that three weeks. You know, couldn't write, literally couldn't write. And, and, and I, you, know, you hear people talk about grief, and you see these things sometimes, and genuinely couldn't motivate myself to do anything. Yeah. Um, but it then, all, then strangely, became a motivation after that to make sure that I got it out there. You know, to get it finished, yes. get it done. Um, but in terms of the actual process itself, I found it okay. I did, I found it okay. I mean, I think one of the things I would really congratulate you on is the blog and the book are separate entities. Mm-hmm. The blog is opinion and insight and all that. The book is your story, but it's told in an entertaining way, and it's not told, as I said before, like a normal footballer's autobiography, which is why it's so good. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, it's, as, I, as I keep trying to say to people, it's biographical, but it's not an autobiography. Yeah because there's observations through yes. it as well obviously there's experiences and things that I've done but there's, there's parts in it that kind of drift away from that that tell you relate it to football now and stuff so it's it's biographical but or else I would just put on the front my my autobiography exactly. which I don't think it is you know no it's not are you using can I borrow a chair yeah Yeah, I mean, it is, it's, it is really, and there's a lot of stuff in there, um, which people have to buy the book and read, that people would never normally share, you know, finances, things like that, and it's stuff that we can all relate to, and I think that's what makes the difference well, that's, a, that's, that's part of dispelling that myth, you know, that 
footballers are all millionaires and they've got an easy lifestyle and all that kind of stuff. Where are the, for the majority of people, the guys that's not earning the millions for Sky and the English Premier League and all that, the majority of players in Scotland, that's the reality. That yeah. is what football is, you know. Because yeah. you talked about even having uh, jobs in that where it might not have been financially viable for you to travel to the job. Mm-hmm and still maintain a house in Glasgow yeah. because the job's elsewhere and yeah. people would automatically assume oh you'll be getting travel expenses and hotels and that it's just not the case no it doesn't happen no. it, it's the way, the way the game is in Scotland things are so tight nobody's prepared to give you money for something that's no actually you can't affect you know, it's not your football it's not your training it's not your game it's not your management I'm not going to pay you for doing something over and above that that's just the reality of football in Scotland and of course the book is called Taxi for Farrell Obviously, you're a taxi driver now. First thing I want to ask you about that is, have you actually managed to now learn every street in Glasgow, every industrial estate, every nooky cranny? <laughs> yeah, I, I talk to guys who's been taxi drivers for 30 years, and you never know everything. Never. So you just pick it up as you're going along. You learn as much as you can as you're going along. But no, there's absolutely no way you could know anything like all the streets and all the industrial estates and the bingo aye, halls aye, and the auction we, houses and the banks. And the aye, because <laughs> I mean, I come from Edinburgh and my knowledge of Glasgow is primarily Celtic Park, Ibrox, Hamden. And the County House. Aye, the County House. <laughs> and Glasgow's a big city. Yeah. You know what I mean? Aye, so, it's vast, it is, it's I mean, big. you must have had some interesting experiences with a taxi, both because of David Farrell and just as a taxi driver. Mean, it, it's, it, it's a great. It's a great thing. You, you meet. I love speaking to people. You know, I love talking to people. And, and inevitably, when you're working on a Saturday or when there's a game on, the talk gets round to football. And some people will say, "Oh, you're David Farrell, aren't you?" And as I say, almost everyone to a man that's wants to talk about football just wants to talk about football. I'm not interested in the background. I'm not interested in the Celtic thing, the Rangers thing, whatever it is. They just want to talk about football, and that's brilliant for me. That just keep, keeps you going, you know. And for some reason, being a taxi driver seems to be a lot more acceptable as a job for an yeah. ex-football player than, than some jobs. Yeah, yeah, I know. I mean, I know you talked about that in the book, about working on building sites and all that, and feeling as though players that you met were kind of looking at you as if to say, is this where you've ended up in that? But you're right, taxi drivers, it used to, I guess it used to be owning pubs. That's back right, in the aye, day. aye. Um, then most players seem to just drink the profit and that, yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, and, and, and there's something that I've grown up with for years. Are Glasgow taxi drivers still the barometer of information? They're supposed to be, but that's a myth as well. <laughs> <laughs> They're supposed to be, but it's definitely a myth as well. Because I can remember being in a taxi a few, a few years ago and was talking about Celtic sign. I think it was Vida Reset or something like that. And the taxi was like, well, I picked a guy up and he was saying this and he was saying that. And, of course, when you heard that, before the internet, you thought, yeah. listen. But the, but the, the problem is that taxi drivers hear the information second, third or fourth hand yeah. as well and it just goes around all the taxi drivers so everybody then will go oh, I picked the guy up or I knew the guy that picked the guy up or I, I was talking to the guy that picked the guy up that knew the guy <laughs> up you know and that's how it comes about like that it's it's very rarely is it somebody picks up the signing from the airport and takes them to Celtic yeah, Park yeah, yeah. No very very stuff. rarely you no know because the other la- the last thing I wanted to say about that was the if I get the train to Queen Street and it's maybe raining and got to go to the taxi Celtic Park please and it'll either be silence or oh you've got to the game mate aye <laughs> <laughs> there's never any in between with like, you know well I mean? that is sure that's Glasgow isn't it though that's Glasgow and I've spoke to taxi drivers nothing wrong with that we have I've said I've pulled them up like maybe I've got to Kennedy after the game and can I get a taxi how can you never get a taxi he says it's because we're all at the game <laughs> so that would you go over to Ibrox and pick them up, you know what I mean? So, but that's been fantastic. Now, the, just say again, folks, the, the book is Taxi for Farrell. Buy it at all good bookshops, Amazon, everywhere you want. It's available on techobooks.co.uk. Perfect. Read it. It's what's and all. It is a great Christmas present. Not just for Hibs fans, Airdrie fans, Partick, Albion, Rovers, anybody like that. Football fans in general that love the game, you'll love this book. But to thank Faz for all his honesty and for giving up an hour he's huge taxi income um, and as I, say, as I say every week the background noise was supplied to you by the accountant house and from here we'll meet you at Homeboys Extra we'll see you again soon thank you